Hello everyone, this hour on Verbling, the next in my great short story series. We're doing a new short story today, Vladimir Nabokov's Signs in Symbols. This is, <laughs> this is, uh, it's, it's an easy story to read, but it's a very difficult story to understand what's really going on. And there's a lot of interesting things we can talk about. Well, we'll get to it in just a minute. Um, first, a bit about me. I'm John Eric, your Verbling teacher for this hour. And I'm an American teacher hanging out from Lisbon, Portugal, to bring you this class. And by the way, three quick rules to help you participate in my class are the following. Don't forget to turn off, tune in, and open up. Which means, please, whenever you're not speaking, Turn off your microphone so that we can keep the classroom as quiet as possible. Microphone's off for the moment. Rule number two is tune in to the new words that you're going to learn. Use them as actively as you can throughout the class so that I can give you feedback and you can learn. And rule three, open up to your classmates. Relax and have fun. We're all here to learn and this is a safe and respectful place to practice your English. So those are a few quick words about the class, and now I want to know a little bit about you. Let me see if I can get my camera back on here. Give me just a second. Uh, it is on, kind of. Yes, yes. All right. Maybe the background's a little bit distracting. So we're going to get started in just a minute. Let me just say a quick hello just to, let's see if I know everyone. Claudio, are you the same Claudio that was in the other class, or are you a different Claudio? Uh, a different Claudio. <laughs> yeah. A different Claudio. Claudio, where are you, Claudio, from? I'm from Chile. You're from Chile. You are a different Claudio than before. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, it's always good to have different Claudios in different classes. He's it's my good friend. <laughs> he often yeah. joined bubbling into classes. Uh, oh, but I don't... Yes. But have I met you before, Claudio? Yeah, about uh, a long time ago. A long time ago, okay. And you had a, maybe a different picture back then, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. But we do know Anatoly. Oh, we know Anatoly. We go way back. Right, Anatoly? Uh, yes, hello. Anatoly, from Azerbaijan. No. No, from yes. Moscow. Yes. Yes, yes. From Moscow. that one, okay. Not the, not the other Anatoly from Azerbaijan, not that one. You're the one from Moscow. There is, a, there is no other Anatoly. I'm just making that up. And what about George? Hello, George. Uh, hi, teacher. How are you? Teacher? Oh, you must be new. Oh, yeah. George, you're the teacher. <laughs> no, I, I am new in your class. No, I mean, Beverly. <laughs> George, in my, in my classes, you're the teacher, not me. You're the teacher. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to learn from you. That's how it works in my classes. You must be new. <laughs> so, so, George, if you Hi, click, if you click on this link here in the window, the one that says docs.google.com/document, if you click on that, you're going to open our story for today, and I'll sh I'll share my screen so you can see it, but. You should open it in your computer. You can open it or you can download it. It doesn't matter. And you can see right now my and is opening. It's going to take a second. Uh, there you go. Does anyone recognize that face? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Who could forget that face? Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know why he's wearing boxing gloves? I'm just curious. Does anyone know the story behind this picture? Just curious. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know the story behind this picture, but anyway, it's a good picture. Oh, wait, we've got someone new. Who's this? Giancarlo. I didn't see you come in. How are you? Hello, John. Hello, John. Good morning. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Just fine, excellent. Just beginning my day, taking classes. And Just beginning your day. It's already it's already 4:20 <laughs> in the afternoon. Oh my God! No, no, no. no, no, no. It's, tw it's 21 after 10 here in Mexico. Oh, it's very early. We're not in Mexico. We're we're in Europe. 
later. Listen, Giancarlo, open that link, and I'll tell you what. Maybe what I can do is, I just realized I should get, I should share my screen. It's a little easier. So give me a second. I'm going to download this as a PDF, and I'll share my screen so that way you can read off the screen if you prefer, or you can just open the link and read on your computer. But give me just a second to open this document. I'm doing it right now. Sure, oh, sure. that was fast. That was fast. Look at that. It worked. So let me share my screen now, and we'll get started. There you go. So I have to confess this is one of my favorite short stories of all time. Um, uh, I re I, I've read it many times, but I haven't read it in about 10 years. But I, I've read this story repeatedly and never fully figured out what it's about. So... Maybe, maybe as a class, we can try to figure it out together. This is Science and Symbols by Vladimir, Vladimir Nabokov. This was written for the New Yorker magazine in 1948. Nabokov had a successful career in three languages. So after being a young writer in Russia, he went to France, and then he was a young writer in France. And then he went to America, and he picked up a new language and became a writer and Nobel Prize winner in English. It's quite an achievement, actually. And, some, and he said when he wrote Lolita that Lolita was not about a young girl. It was about the English language. It was about his flirtation with this new young culture and this new language. That's what he said. I don't know if I believe him, but that's what he said. Nabokov was strictly anti-Freudian. He was quite different from his contemporaries of the day. So... And he was also a scientist, by the way. He was a um, he was a uh, a biologist. He had two careers. So while he was writing and lecturing on literature, he also collected not collected because he wasn't killing them, but he was hunting butterflies. That was his other job, and he wrote scientific papers on the study of butterflies. And in fact, scientific. Let's see. I can't remember the name of that. He's a lep lepidopterist. Yeah, that's the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> a scientist. Collector of, uh, collector of uh, butterflies. Yeah, I don't know if he collected them, but he studied them. I, I'm not sure if he was actually... Yeah, how do you say this word? Lepidopterology. Lepidopterology. Believe me, nobody knows that word in the English language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from <Sure>. Wikipedia. <laughs> if if you if you say to someone you're if you say to someone, hey, Nabokov was a lep lep lepidopterologist, they would say, you know, does did he take medication for that? Because it <laughs> sounds like something you don't want to have. But anyway, because he was an established scientist, he was also a very prominent literary critic of his day because he knew how to analyze things and he approached texts the way he would approach a new species. He would first classify it into parts, divide it up, and then try to describe it. But we don't really do literary theory that way or literary criticism that way. But it was very interesting to read his essays about fame, to listen to his lectures in Cornell and to read his essays about about masterpieces. He wrote, he has a famous lecture on um, the metamorphosis by Kafka and others. So, really interesting. Maybe we could use his style of literary criticism to analyze signs and symbols and see if we can figure it out. Maybe that would be a good approach. Anyway, I'm not going to say very much more. Let's just read it and think about it. So, we're on slide or page two. And I'll try to make this a little bit bigger so that we can all see. Give me a second here. And, well, let's just all take a paragraph. So, Yuki, why don't you get us started? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Signs, uh, Signs and Symbols by Vladimir Nabokov. Nab In Russian, Nabokov. How to say? Nabokov. Yeah? Well, he was always correcting Americans. He was always saying, <laughs> Nabokov. Oh, no, you must say Vladimir Nabokov. So he was always correcting us. We, we say it wrong in English, so uh, you can say it right. 
if, uh, so I'm, I'll say in Russia, uh, Nabokov. For the for the first time in as many years, they they were front conf, they are they are confronted with the problem of what birthday present to take to young man who was incurable incurably. Wait a second. Incurably, 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 incurably deranged in 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 the mind. Desires he had none. Man, man made objects were to him either hives of evil, vibrant with the malignant, Correct. malignant activity that he alone could pa perceive, or gross comfort for, for which no use could be found in his abstract world. After Eliminating the, a number of articles that might of, offend him or a flight on him, and it's anything in the gadget line, for instance, was taboo. His parents choose a dainty and innocent trifle, a basket with ten different fruit, jelly, jellies, jellies. Jellies, sorry. Ten, ten different fruit jellies in ten little jars. Okay, let's just make sure that everything is clear in the first paragraph. Who are the people and what are they going to do? That's the main thing you need to know in paragraph one. Who are the people we're describing and what are they just about to do? This is for anyone. Can you answer that question? Anyone. Who are the people we're describing? Uh oh, not clear. <laughs> so we're describing uh, one, one guy in particular. Parents and child. Right, right, right. And parents uh, want to uh, give a present, a present, birthday present. That's right. To, to his, to their child. That's right. But so we're, des their... we're describing the child. Uh, and the parents are just about to visit him, and they're trying to select a gift, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what's the obstacle here? Why can't they just get him a teddy bear? What's the obstacle? What's making the What's making the choice of gift difficult? Uh, he tried to eliminate articles that could. Uh, Offend or fright he uh, of him. Fright him. Yeah. That's absolutely right. For some reason, he's apparently afraid of everything. So they have to eliminate anything which might offend him or frighten him. Because normal things are hives of evil. What's a hive? What kind of creature lives in a hive? What kind of creature in nature? Be. Bees, right. Bees live in a hive. Yes. So these are hives of evil. Think about a beehive. It's full of activity, moving around and buzzing. So you can kind of picture this sense of evil of things, creepy, crawly things, buzzing and moving around. That's what normal objects are like for him. Why are normal objects hives of evil? What do we know about him so far? Is he a normal person? He uh, lived in an uh, abstract world. Exactly. And, there's, and even more specifically, in the second line, a young man who was incurably deranged in the mind. Deranged. What does that mean? Incurably unusual. deranged. What? An unusual. Uh, not uh, ordinary. Not ordinary. Mm -hmm. Deranged no. is somehow no. No. insane. Some kind of, uh, psychological disease. Psychological mm -hmm. disease is correct. So there's, and Yuki said insane. Deranged usually is a synonym of insane. So more modernly, we would say he's got some psychological problem or even a disease. Absolutely. So this is an. Uh, we we've got to make sure all that is clear in paragraph one. 
because it's such a short story that every paragraph is there for a very specific reason. So we got to make sure all those details are clear. And notice, it's the fourth time in as many years. It's the fourth time in how many years? Four years. Fourth time in as many years. It's the fourth time in four years that they are confronted with the problem of what to get him for his birthday. How long has he been in an asylum? How long has he been in the crazy house? How long? It's the fourth time in as many years. So he's been there for? Many years. Four years. <laughs> Four years. Four years. Four years. Four years. <laughs> So he's a young man, and he's been locked up for four years. So that means probably he probably has been there. So that means he's probably how old? How old would you say? How old would you guess he was? If you had to guess, mm -hmm. there's no no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. How old do you think he is? Seventeen. Uh, Seventeen. Yeah, could be. Any other guesses? I would say that he's probably. See, 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah, I would say, I was going to say 15 or 16, because usually schizophrenia and that kind of thing worsens around puberty. So, somewhere between, so, so four years after 12, so 16 or something, 17, maybe 16. Uh, somewhere in there, usually the problems hit pretty hard. And then sometimes in your later teens, you can recover or recover a bit. And for some reason, some people it comes later. But I would imagine he's 15, 16, maybe even 17. Absolutely. Something like that. All right. So the rest of the paragraphs, we don't need to spend quite so much time on. But I just want to make sure all of the important details are, cl are clear in the first paragraph so it's easier to understand the rest. And one more question. What is the innocent gift that they've decided on in the end? What is it? A basket with basket. Ten different fruits. Fruit jelly. Yes. Fruit jelly, not je not fruit, but fruit jelly. What you call dos, dolce. <laughs> right? Clear? Clear. Mm -hmm. Yes. George, George, you understand? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah. good, good. <clears throat> and it and it's very important. This is the fourth time, and there are ten fruit jellies. Numbers are very important in this story, as you'll see. Well, George, why don't you continue with the second paragraph? Okay. At the time of his birth, wait, they wait, had already... Let, let me fix the text for you. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. At the time of his birth, they had already been married for a long time. A score of years had elapsed. And now they were quite old. Her drab, her drab gray hair was pined and pinned, pined, pinned. painted up. Yeah, painted up, carelessly. Uh, well, uh, she, she wore cheap black dresses, and like other women of her age, such as M Mrs. Sol, uh, their next door neighbor was faced was all pink and mauve, 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 which is a color, mauve, uh -huh. mauve, with paint and was had was a cluster of brookside flowers. She presented an a naked white countenance to the fault-finding light of spring. Her husband who in the old country had been a fairly successful businessman, was now in New York, wholly depend on his brother Isaac, a real American of almost 40 years standing. They seldom saw Isaac and had nicknamed him the Prince. Why do you think they call him the Prince? Why that particular name? What do you think? Do you think that's a good name, or are they being kind of, are they kind of, I don't know, a little bit resentful of him? Maybe he could be sarcastic. Exactly. Why do you think they're being a little sarcastic, calling him the prince? They're not, they're not calling it to his face, of course. They're saying that to each other. But why do you think they might be a little bit resentful toward, toward Isaac? 
or Isaac or Isaac, whatever you say his name. What does he got that they don't that they don't got? Maybe because his life, it, it could be a wealthy, exactly. a successful businessman. Well, her husband was successful before he came to America, but Isaac is successful in America. He's a real American. What does that mean, real American? In other words, he's got a passport, and, and, the, and the husband had to emigrate. Right, he had to come over like later, and he's not a real citizen. So probably there's a there's a bit of resentment because this guy was a businessman, and now he's nothing in America. So he feels kind of impotent, right? He can't really do anything. So there's probably some resentment. So they start calling him the prince because without Isaac's money, they wouldn't even be able to survive. And just one more question: the wife. What sets her apart from other old women? How is she different? This is for anyone. It's not just for George. Anyone. How you can answer this. How is the wife different than other old women of her age? Mm -hmm. She was pale. She's pale? Okay. And does she try to hide it in any way? Do the other women try to hide their age in any way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says some something about that. Her hair, that right. she uses it care, carelessly. Right, carelessly. so she doesn't really care that much about her hair. And most important, she doesn't wear makeup like, like Mrs. Soul next door. She doesn't paint her face with pink and mauve and blue and all these crazy colors. She just accepts her old age or, or she doesn't care. Naked yeah. white of face, yeah. Yeah, naked white countenance. Countenance means your appearance. So she has a. She just presents herself the way she is. So maybe she accepts her old age, or maybe she just doesn't have the energy to bother. She just doesn't care. So these sound like old, tired people to me. I don't know. Let's find out more. Jean Leon, it's your turn. Take paragraph three for us. Okay, that Friday. Their son's bright birthday, everything went wrong. The subway train lost its life current between two stations for a quarter of an hour. They couldn't they could hear nothing but the doubtful dutiful. Ah, the dutiful. dutiful. From the word duty, like it's my duty to protect my country. I'm joining the army. Right? Okay. It's the duty. Duty is your responsibilities. Okay. So they, they hear the dutiful beating of the hearts, of right? The heart. uh, can you make perhaps the text more bigger? Uh, I'll try. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Uh, I can't make it. Give me a second here. Maybe I can do 145. Nope. Because I can't fit it all on screen. Yeah. 140. Okay. Uh, what about that? Is that better? Yeah, it's yeah, it's much better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so they so could hear nothing but the dutiful beating of their hearts and the rustling of newspaper. The bus they had to take next was late and kept them waiting a long time on the street corner. And when it, it did come, it was crammed with garrulous right. high school garrulous. Garrulous high school children. It began to, run, to rain as they walked up the brown path leading to the sanitarium. 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 There they waited again, and instead of their boy shoving into the room as he really did, his poor first sullen, confused, sullen, confused, ill 
shaven and blotched with acne. Acne. A nurse they knew and did. A nurse they knew and did not care for appeared at at last and brightly explained that he had again attempted to take his life. He was all right, she said, but a visit from his parents might disturb him. The place was so miserably understaffed and things got mislaid or mixed up so easily that they decided not to leave their present in the office but to bring it to him next time they came. That's it. So, does this sound like a good place to be, <laughs> this sanitarium? No, not at all. Not at all. No. It, it's understaffed. That means that they don't have enough doctors there. Okay. And how do they feel about their son's nurse? Do they like her? Do they like the nurse? Is she a nice woman? What do you think? No, they, no. they, don't, they don't seem to, to like her. They don't seem to like her. And notice something. They don't care for her, and, oh. that, and then she brightly explains that he had taken his life. She brightly explains. Who's sarcastic now? <laughs> if you tell someone that their child tried to commit suicide, would you explain it brightly? I don't think so. No, mo with more com compassion? Exactly. More compassion. She has no compassion. She's almost teasing them. She's almost taunting them to brightly mention, oh, by the way, your son tried to kill himself today. How's the weather? So clearly, Nabokov is saying a lot with, with just a few words. He's not explaining the relationship, but we can guess the relationship by these few details. So we now know why they don't like the nurse, because she doesn't care. She has no compassion. She doesn't see these patients as people. That's what I would guess. And by the way, we know that he's got to be 16 or so because he's shaving. He often is ill-shaven. He doesn't shave. But he's blotched with acne, so that means he's still a teenager because most adults don't have acne. You know, when you have to put the medicine on your face, especially if you're a boy, usually it's for boys, <laughs> sometimes for girls. Yeah. Right? So, so he's probably about 16, yeah. Okay, very, very good. So now we know a little bit more and we know something else. That it doesn't have a very easy life, obviously. Something's going on because he's tried to kill himself and it's not the first time. It's not the first time. So, wait a second. How come I've got two Jean Carlos? I've got Jean Leon and Jean Carlo. Okay, I was confused. Jean Carlo. <laughs> Jean Carlo, yeah. Jean Carlo. <laughs> Continue, okay. please. Yeah, paragraph number four, right? Uh, I can't see the numbers. Wait. Yes, four. Okay. Outside the building, she waited for her husband to open his umbrella and then took his arm. He kept clearing his throat, as he always did, when he was upset. They reached, they reached the bus stop shelter on the other side of the street, and he closed his umbrella. A few feet away, under a swaying and dripping tree, a tiny unfleeched bird was helplessly w uh, twitching in a puddle. In a puddle. In a puddle. A puddle of water. A puddle of water. Yeah. Right. Keep going. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, during the long ride to the subway station, she and her husband did not exchange a word, and every time she glanced at at his old hands, clasped and Chin up on the handle of his umbrella and saw their swollen veins and brown spotted skin. She felt the mounting pressure of tears as she looked around, trying to hook her mind onto something. It gave her a kind of soft shock 
a mixture of compassion and wonder to notice that one of the passengers, a girl with a dark hair and grubby red toenails, was weeping on the shoulder of an older woman whom did a man resemble? She resembled Rebecca Borisovna, whose daughter had married one of the Solvay, oh, I'm sorry, Solvay kings, Solvay kings in Minsk years ago. So, where are these people from? Where's Minsk? <laughs> so they're not American. Where are they from? Uh, Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Wow. So, and this is written in 1948, so the, the, who knows exactly when they came over, but it's very clear that they're somehow not part of the culture. And look at that. She starts to reminisce about being back, about Rebecca Barznova, one of the Solovichiks <laughs> in Minsk years ago. Look, there's no dialogue here. But if there was dialogue, what do you think she would be saying to her husband? Just out of curiosity, if they were speaking, what do you think she would be saying to her husband on the subway, on the way home? Yeah. Any ideas? Um, maybe about uh, their child. Sure. What what might she be saying? What is kind of is attempting to su suicide? Or? That's right. That's right. And she's looking at her husband. His his hands are old and spotted with brown spots, and he's twitching because he's old. So sometimes old people shake. <laughs> but also, he's silent. Because she knows him. She knows when there's a problem, he's silent. So she might, if they were speaking, she might tell him not to worry, that their son is in a good place, that it's going to be okay. She might be comforting him. But in fact, there's a kind of elephant in the room, right? They can't really speak about it. This has happened before, and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to handle it. That's the impression that I get. And... She starts reminiscing about Russia, too. Her mind's kind of wandering. So, I don't know. Maybe she's trying to avoid uh, he make a scene for something about his illness. Uh huh. So, she, she wants to avoid having the husband start to cry in public? Is that what you mean? Yeah, or something weird. Uh, I think she tried to keep calm. Try right. to uh, avoid, excite uh, the mind of his uh, husband. The mind of her husband. Uh, her husband, thank you. Right, right. Yeah, maybe she's the one who keeps control in the family. It's hard to say. But absolutely, there's something. Clearly, they're in shock because they came to give him a present and he's not available because obviously something happened. So, hang on a second here. Let's let me go down to the next page. Oops. Oh, what's, there we go. There we go. So we're we're gonna do. We're on the end of. No, we're on six and seven. Seven is a bit long, but maybe I'll do seven just because it's really long. Um, let's go on to. We're on to Claudio for number six. Okay. The last time the boy had tried to do it. His method had, had been, in the doctor's words, a masterpiece of inventiveness. He would have succeeded had not an envious fellow patient, through, though he thought, was thought, thought, thought he was learning to fly, and stopped him just in time. What he has, had really wanted to do was to tear a hole in his world and escape. So this is his this is his way of trying to kill himself. We don't really know what he did, <laughs> but we can hear it through the psychologist. He was trying to tear a hole in his world and escape. 
we can only imagine what he was really doing. Well, why don't you continue for the first half of um, paragraph seven, Claudio, and then Anthony and ah, Anatoly can take over. Go ahead, Claudio, continue. Okay. The system of its delusions had been the subject of an elaborate paper in a scientific monthly which the doctor at the sanitarium had given to them to read. But long before that, she and her husband had puzzled it out of themselves. Wait, they had puzzled it out for themselves? For themselves, yes. Uh, referential man mania, the article had called it. In, th in these very rare cases, the patient imagines that every everything happening around him him is a veiled reference to his personality and existence. He includes real people from the conspiracy because he considers himself to be so much more intelligent than other men. Phenomenal nature shadows him wherever he goes. Clouds in the staring sky transmit to each other by means of slow signs, incredibly detailed information regarding him. His inmost thoughts are discussed at nightfall in manual alphabet by darkly gesticulating trees, pebbles or stains or sun flecks from patterns representing in some awful way messages that he must intercept. Everything it's a cipher and of everything he is this, the theme. All around him there are sp spies. Spies? Mm -hmm. Some of them are detached or server observers like glass surface and steel pools, poles. Others, such as codes in store windows, are prejudiced witnesses, lynchers, lynchers, lynchers at heart. Others, again, running water storms, are hysterical to to the point of insanity. Have a distorted opinion of them, and grotesque, grotesquely misinterpret his actions. He must be always on his guard and devote every minute of mod module, module of life to the decoding of the undulation of things. So wait, every module of his life, he has to devote every module of his life to the decoding of the undulation of things, undulate, the movement, the waving of things. So he sees all this movement and it all means something. That's the undulation, the movement of things, just so that's clear. Mm -hmm. uh, the very air he exhales is indexed and filled away. Filed away. Filed away. If only he, uh, the interest he provokes were limited to his immediate surroundings but alas, it is not. With distance, the torrent of wild scandal increases in volume and volubility. Volu volubility. Volubility. The silhouettes of his blood corpuscles. <laughs> corpuscles. 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 Magnified a million times over vast plains and still farther away great mountains of unbearable solid solidity and heights sum up in terms of gran 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 granite 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 and grown in fest fest the ultimate truth of his being Wait, growing furs hmm. See it? Growing furs. Growing furs? Furs are fir trees. Uh -huh. Something like 
like pine trees. Uh, so still farther away, great mountains of unbearable solidity and height sum up they, right, Chazumir, sum up in terms of granite and growing ferns, the ultimate truth of his being. What is this paragraph about, everyone? <laughs> what, what is this description? To me, this is one of the great descriptive passages in 20th century literature. But maybe you don't agree, I don't know. But let's figure out, what's it about? What's being described here? I think this is about what I can remember the name. Uh, the what what that man feels and thinks exactly. around what the sun, what the sun feels, right? The sun of the of the old people, the, in the sanitarium. That guy. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. Sorry, the what what he thinks uh, and feels around around him. Exactly. So this is like a description of his, uh, whatever his problem is, this is like a description of what's, how he sees the world. <clears throat> if you had to sum up his psychological problem in a word or two, how would you summarize it? What words come to mind when you think about this description? What kind of words come to mind? What kind of problem does he have? Referential mania. Yeah, that's what they call it, but what does that mean? What what descriptive words come to mind when you think about this problem? Uh, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. Uh, schizophrenia. Right. Anything else? A word that comes to my mind is paranoia. Right? Paranoia. Yeah. When you think there's a conspiracy around you, mm. right? So he may be schizophrenic. There seems to be a lot of <coughs> paranoia. Hysteria. Uh, Hysteria. Uh, Absolutely. Excuse me, can you write those words in the chat? Uh? I highly doubt it, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> paranoia. Uh, no, I can't. Fortunately, I have spell check, so through okay. the magic of spell check, I can write paranoia. Um, schizophrenia. schizophrenia. With a PH, because in English it's spelled with a PH. Schizophrenia. Oh, schi uh, schizophrenia. Have, have, uh, you, have you heard the song King Crimson's 21st century schizoid man? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the famous song. I think I, I heard it 35 years ago. Sure. <laughs> I don't I don't remember it. It's a 35 years ago. I think so. It's from the it's like 75, right? Yes. Or maybe it's earlier. Sing it for us, Yuki. Can you sing it? I I can I can I can <laughs> it's just the just beginning. Of the that's the music. When we make the movie of this short story, that's the music we'll use. Okay, Yuki? Okay, I'm sorry. Not the original, your cover version, the version of you singing. <laughs> so it's interesting that. Oh, just one quick, one quick point here. The conspiracy is in material objects like clouds and rain and jackets and rocks. Why are there no people conspiring against him and talking about him? Why are there no people? Why does he think? I mean, what is it about? What is it that he thinks about himself that precludes the possibility of people being involved in the conspiracy? Did you pick up that detail? Yeah, because he yeah. considered that he's more intelligent than other people. Yeah, much, and he, much more. Much more. He's a he's a genius, and no one. He's the genius of the universe, and it might be true, <laughs> because as we find out more and more about his parents, we begin to think he might be right. Um, listen, we're going to do the second half of this class in one minute. I have to. 
I just have to close this hour and open the next one. Okay, so we're gonna get, we're gonna pick up from eight. Uh, we're about halfway through actually, from eight until how many paragraphs is it? It's about it says it's like thirty-two, but there's a lot of one-liners later on. So we're roughly halfway through the story actually. Okay, so I'm gonna stop now and I'll be back in one minute for the second half of class. Okay. So if you okay, could, if, if for any reason you can't get back in, just watch it on the video if you can't get in for any reason. But I think it's not booked, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and okay, I'll be back in just a minute. See you soon. Okay. See you soon. Okay. Bye for now. Bye for bye for now.